2020 has been a mixed year for the altcoin markets. Some projects have faltered, while others have hit the lights out. Chainlink is a project that falls into the latter category. In fact, this year has seen it as one of the best performing altcoins in the space. It's also a project which I've covered in the past and have been keenly tracking since. So, what's up with Chainlink? Overhyped or just ripe to hit out the lights? I'm Guy, and in this video, I'll be answering just that. I'll be diving into the underlying use cases and analyzing link price potential. And if you watch till the very end, I'll let you know exactly how I've positioned my portfolio to reflect my views. A few quick things before we embark on this journey. Now, I'm just a guy who digs crypto and does videos like this for your educational purposes. It's not financial advice. Not now, not ever. Please consult your financial guide before diving into the crypto waters. And if you just happen to be strolling by, welcome to my community. I release videos like this regularly, so I'd suggest you hit up that subscribe button and turn on the notifications. Get plugged into the Coin Bureau matrix. Oh, and finally, full disclosure, I do hold Link in my personal portfolio. I've got to be transparent with my loyal subscribers. Okay, enough pitter-patter, let's get cracking. Now, no analysis of Chainlink can be done without understanding exactly what it is and what it's trying to achieve. So I need to give a short overview of that. Do feel free to hop around with the timestamps below if you want to skip this section. I won't be offended if you do. Promise. So, what is Chainlink? Well, quite simply, it's a decentralized oracle network that provides off-chain data to on-chain resources. It basically acts as middleware between two different environments and bridges the two. Think of Chainlink as some sort of connecting fiber between the blockchain world and the real world. Blockchains are decentralized networks that operate on parameters within their environment. They're generally secure because of all the information that forms this decentralized database can be verified on-chain. However, in order for blockchains to be really useful in the real world, they need to get information about data that is external to them. We're talking prices, events, payments, weather, travel, etc. This data is needed in order to settle decentralized smart contracts that are dependent on them. There is one problem with this though, most of this data comes from centralized sources. So, you build a highly secure and trustless blockchain only to trust that the data you're referencing is correct. To trust that the data has not been manipulated in some way by the centralized entity. Or, what happens if the data is just wrong? When you're relying on a limited number of data sources, these mistakes are harder to spot. So then, there is clearly a problem with centralized data sources. This problem has been around for a long time, longer than Bitcoin itself. In fact, back in 1997, Nick Sabo, who also coined the term smart contract, by the way, spoke of a God protocol. The main idea behind this thesis was to replace trusted third parties with a trustless third party protocol, one that was automated and completely free of control. Fast forward 10 years later, and we have the ICO of Chainlink. Chainlink is trying to solve many of these centralized data issues. Through the use of what are called Oracle nodes, the Chainlink blockchain wants to develop a decentralized network of these oracles. A trustless and robust network where off-chain data can easily be accessed and verified. The need for a network like Chainlinks has become more pertinent with the proliferation of smart contract blockchains such as Ethereum, etc. These smart contracts regularly need off-chain data to operate and up until now have had to rely on centralized Oracle services such as Oracleize, etc. Some have even resorted to building some of their own in-house Oracles on one side of the smart contract. However, how can this really be trusted? You have to rely on data from the other party to the contract. It kind of defeats the purpose. With Chainlink, no problemo. It's all securely there on the Chainlink blockchain to verify. Node operators, or the oracles, have their reputation immutably stored on the network for all to see. A god protocol indeed. 
But Chainlink is not just about connecting smart contracts to off-chain data. It also wants to provide a solution to connect different blockchains. Blockchain interoperability is a well-known problem, and the numerous different standards and protocols mean they operate as independent silos. There have been many projects and initiatives that have tried to crack this chestnut, but only with limited degrees of success. Chainlink, on the other hand, could act as a sort of internet of blockchains, essentially an HTTP-like protocol for messaging at the protocol level both on-chain and off-chain. One network to connect them all. Okay, okay, I got a bit carried away myself with that Chainlink intro. If you want more info on the project, then you can check out the review I did on it last year. However, the most important thing for most of you is that LINK token and its underlying economics. So let's now take a look at that, shall we? Now let's start with a bit of basics. The LINK token is an ERC-677 token that was issued on the Ethereum blockchain. The max supply of LINK is 1 billion with about 35% of that circulating. For those of you who are confused by the token standard, don't be. It's basically a standard ERC-20 token with additional transfer and call functionality. So what does this mean? Well, quite simply, it means that the tokens can be received and processed by contracts within a single transaction. Previously, this needed to be done through a multi-step process on the ERC-20 standard, so it was inefficient. If you want a bit more of a read, I have linked to the docs below. Anyways, the reason that it's important to note the token standard is that it plays a central part in LINK use cases. I'll come back to this in a bit. Back to the tokenomics of LINK though, it has two functions on the Chainlink network. Paid by smart contract creators to reward node operators, and as a bond to run a Chainlink node. In terms of the first one, this can basically be seen as paying for data. These smart contract creators are paying the node operators for the off-chain data feeds that they are providing. Not only that, but they're also paying for the formatting of this data into a blockchain-readable format, as well as all off-chain computations that need to be done. Just like any other fee market, the prices for these services will be set like any market-based product. These node operators will set the prices that they deem appropriate, but it has to be in line with what smart contract creators are willing to pay and what competing nodes are charging. Then, when it comes to link as a bond, this is done in order to guarantee uptime from the nodes. Uptime is essential, especially when smart contracts rely on the data coming from the nodes. By putting link down as collateral, the node operator stands to lose the amount staked if they fail to provide the said data in time. Those who rely on the data, smart contract creators, will determine the amount of link they need as collateral in order for the node operator to service the contract. The more valuable the smart contract is, the more collateral the counterparty will demand. You can think of it as a sort of insurance policy that is taken out by the creators. It's also important to note that node operators are not required to bond link to service a smart contract. It's just that they're unlikely to find demand for their services if they don't play skin in the game. I mean, let's assume the smart contract is for a billion dollar interest rate swap or financial instrument. The users of that data will want some collateral to cover potential losses that could be incurred from faulty data. It just makes sense. Okay, you guys still with me? If you have any questions, by the way, feel free to fire them in the comments and I'll try to get back to you. Anyway, these are the main use cases for Link. But the most important question is, how could this impact on price? So let's take a look at that. When it comes to demand for LINK to pay the node operators, this is based on how many transactions are taking place on the network. As more smart contract developers start utilizing the Oracle services, they will need LINK tokens in order to settle their data requests. And while we're on this point, I want to come back to a general theme that I found from my previous video. People asked why there was even a need to use the LINK token in the Chainlink ecosystem. Can't they just use Ethereum or some other cryptocurrency as the medium of exchange? Well, no, they can't. This is because of that transfer and call functionality that I mentioned earlier. Other token standards don't have this functionality to trigger logic when funds are received. This functionality is central to the Chainlink economic model. 
Okay, so the smart contract operators will need to collect Link in order to pay for the off-chain data from these off-chain providers. If there are competing users in the system, then they will drive up the price of these services and hence demand for Link. Holding all else constant, increased demand for Link with a constant supply leads to an increase in price. But all things are not constant. There is a decreasing supply. Let's also not forget that the node operators have to bond Link into a smart contract in order to service said contract. This is tied to the smart contract for as long as the agreement remains. It's removed from circulation until it is once again unlocked from the contract. As mentioned, more Link collateral will be demanded for those smart contracts developed for high value use cases. Think, for example, of a bond issuance, a supply chain, a derivatives trading house. The more funds that are involved in the smart contract, the more Link insurance the creators will demand. As the network grows and more people use the oracles to provide data services, so too will the amount of Link tied into the contracts. In fact, it makes logical sense that the total bonded for insurance be proportional to the value of the contracts. Bringing all this together, one, increased demand from contract creators to pay nodes. Two, increased demands from node creators to bond Link and provide Oracle services. Three, reduce supply from Link locked up. That seems like all the economic ingredients for an increasing price. And these could very well feed into each other in some sort of virtuous feedback loop. The more valuable the Link token, the more value that can be bonded. The higher the insurance available by the nodes, the more likely creators of valuable contracts are to use it. And by them using it, they increase transactional utility demand for Link. And so on and so on. Okay, so I've made the case for how the Link token can get value. But this is all predicated on whether the network is being used. A network can have amazing token economics, but if it ain't been adopted, then it's nothing but a nice concept. So, how is adoption going on Chainlink? Well, pretty damn good it seems. One resource that I encourage you to check out is this 2019 end of year review, which I've also linked to below. Although it's a few months old, the growth over the whole year is quite extraordinary. For example, here is a running total of Chainlink node job runs. No, that's not an exponentially increasing COVID curve. That's the total number of tasks that these nodes have completed in only eight months, from May to December. This is another chart I found pretty illuminating. It's the total amount of the network activity that is attributable to the Oracle jobs. Unlike many other blockchains which are just used for transferring tokens onto or off exchanges to trade, Chainlink is being used as intended. Over 80% of the activity was related to Oracle jobs. This is also a pretty cool graphic that the author drew up. Basically, it shows the Chainlink nodes on the network as well as some of the reference contracts that they have been serving data to. This is mostly pricing, but it illustrates the relatively decentralized nature of the Oracle network. No central point of failure. One more stat that I want to check out for the network is the amount of smart contracts that are using Link tokens. This shows the extent to which developers are using the network in their smart contracts. A perfect example of utility demand on the network. It's pretty clear that this curve ain't flattening. A large part of this growth has to be attributed to the proliferation of DeFi over the past few months. Decentralized finance applications naturally need to reference off-chain data in order to settle their smart contracts. Chainlink appears to be their main port of call. The list is really too long to go over now, but here is a snippet of them. This has also continued well into 2020. There are actually a few that I think you may be interested in. Towards the end of last year, Synthetix teamed up with Chainlink to bring decentralized price feeds to Ethereum. Chainlink's Oracle technology was integrated into the Synthetix platform. For those who don't know, Synthetix is trying to provide a decentralized alternative to the likes of BitMEX et al. with their smart contract on-chain synthetic assets, or synths. I've covered them in more detail in a separate video if you want the full overview. However, when it comes to DeFi projects, they are the second most valuable when it comes to total value locked in their smart contracts. 
They see the value in decentralized price feeds and Chainlink was their first port of call. So keep an eye on that. Another DeFi project on that list that is making use of Chainlink's tech is Bancor. They announced earlier this year that Bancor version 2 will have an automated market maker liquidity pool which will use Chainlink's price oracles. I've linked to Bancor's disclosure below, but according to Asaf Shakaf, Bancor's head of product, Chainlink are experts in oracles. They know how to make oracles that are more resilient to market changes. Moving on with this hot list of partners, you also have the Celsius network that has teamed up with Chainlink. They will use their oracles to help them determine their interest rates in a decentralized manner. Why rely on interest rate data from the banks? That's so 2008. Now, something else that I really like about some Chainlink collaborations is that they've expanded beyond just the Ethereum ecosystem. For example, Polkadot became the first non-Ethereum chain to integrate Chainlink. Chainlink will become the first and primary Oracle provider for all of the substrate-based chains. For those that don't know, Polkadot was created by Ethereum co-founder Gavin Wood and is a network for connecting and launching blockchain applications. Keeping with the non-Ethereum theme, you have the pretty recent announcements from two Tezos development companies that they will be integrating Chainlink oracles into Tezos-based smart contracts. For those who don't know, I'm also a big fan of Tezos, so it's great to see the two technologies being used side by side. Now, there are many more projects and blockchains that have integrated with Chainlink, so I can't go over all of them here. But safe to say that Chainlink's network growth is not likely to slow down soon. There's one more thing that I want to look at, and that is the exchange support and broader community. Firstly, Chainlink has done pretty well in the listing department. They managed to secure a much coveted Coinbase Pro listing in June of last year. The listing saw an explosion in trading volume and price. It's no secret that Coinbase is one of the first entry points for most retail traders coming into the crypto space. Of course, Link is also listed on a plethora of other exchanges with sizable volume, liquidity, and trading pairs. Again, I can't list them all here, but here is a quick rundown. Binance, Kraken, Bittrex, Huobi, OKX, etc. Oh, and uh, anyone from New York here? You guys will legally be allowed to buy Link on the Gemini exchange. Gemini recently listed Link, which means that another direct fiat on-ramp is available for those who want to exchange USD for Link. So it's pretty clear that Link is being made available to millions of people through these exchange listings. That's the kind of awareness that most projects dream of. And speaking of awareness, this brings me on to the Chainlink community or the Link Marines. True to their moniker, this community is a highly effective fighting force that can take on any army. But truth be told, I find the Link community to be a lot more rational and dedicated than some other diehard crypto communities. They are focused on the technology and its core use cases. They are less about hopium, more about realism. And it's not just me that says that. Here is Tyler Winklevoss, the CEO of the Gemini Exchange, sharing his view about the Link community. Now, it perhaps makes sense that Gemini has chosen to list Link over some of the other cryptocurrencies with higher rankings on CMC. Hmm. It's also great to see that this community is growing in force. Data appears to show not only an explosion in the number of Link addresses, but also that it's mostly distributed to those with smaller wallet balances. So basically, lots of smaller wallets being opened up off the exchanges by newer members of the community. Great to see. Now, that's mostly it for my review today. But to be honest, there's so much more that I could have covered. Either way, I think it's fitting that I leave you with some of my personal thoughts. As you can probably tell, I'm quite bullish on Chainlink. I think that the technology is really filling a massive void in the crypto space. Being able to access reliable off-chain data is central to the robustness of decentralized applications and smart contracts. Moreover, this is just the current demand for it. If you believe that smart contracts will power billion dollar industries in the not too distant future, then they are also going to want to tap off-chain data. They're going to want a solution that is censorship resistant, secure, and most importantly, trustless. And as I've shown, the Chainlink network is growing. Organic growth across a wide range of projects and blockchains. 
growth that increases the broader utility of Link for smart contract creators. Link is also widely traded with strong liquidity across numerous markets and trading pairs. The caliber of its listing also helps strengthen its image and bring it front and center to millions of users. Users that join a community that is less dramatic, more pragmatic, and mostly focus on helping others understand Chainlink's technology. As I said in the beginning, I do hold Link, and for those who follow my newsletter and Telegram channel, they will know that I increased my stake. It now makes up a sizable position in my altcoin allocation. So yes, I'm long on Link, and I think it really could be that elusive god protocol that we've all been looking for. That's it for this video, my fellow crypto fans. Now, I know I have said a lot, but I need to hear from you guys. What do you think about Chainlink? Was this a fair review? I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments. And of course, if you like this video, then I would really appreciate it if you smash that like button. Also, if you want more of my Chainlink reviews in the future, don't forget to bang that subscribe button as well. Take care out there. Oh, one more thing before I leave you. I actually have something pretty important to share. Recently, I've started a weekly email newsletter. It's my way of succinctly crystallizing my views on the crypto market for the week ahead. I also share my personal portfolio as well as some juicy coin tips. Keen to be a part? All I need from you is an email. Head on over to the description and click on the link to my sign up page. All you need to do is enter your email address and hit submit. And that's it. You are now locked, loaded and ready to receive my next email. See you guys soon.